would you give it up for Mr. Jonathan Pena in the his house? Let's go. Come on, see if and I has everybody doing tonight. Yes. All I know is that kid, Alex, has got me hungry for some popcorn. Boy, I never eat it the same, bro. Come on, man. Hey, well, I, I just got to, uh, I just want to show honor where honor is due. Hey, online fam, we love you. Thanks for being with us tonight. But I just want to say thank you so much to the Lindsay family for having me tonight, to Pastor Adam, my senior pastor, for being, for allowing me to be here tonight. If you don't have a great church to go to, you need to come see us at Hill City. Come on, you need, you need to be there. I've got some of the most important people in my life to me, actually the most important people in my life uh, to me tonight. I've got my wife of 14 years. I've got my 12-year-old daughter and my 9-year-old son. And then i got some of my Hill City family with us tonight. And so, yes. I'm so excited to be bringing you the word tonight, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background about me, uh, I am uh, I am native Texan to Dallas, and uh, and so yeah, man, born and raised right here. There's everything in the world that I could ever need right here, and uh, and so there was no reason to leave. And so uh, a graduate of CFNI, I'm an alumnus or an alumni. I don't I don't know what the word is, but uh, and then the one thing that always kind of plagued me about CFNI is why there was never a mascot. Like, like, why is there not a CFNI, like, like, Pegasus or a CFNI, you know, like, Nephilim? You know, there needs to be, so y'all need to go ahead and, like, take a poll, submit it to Pastor Adam, Pastor Adam McCain at CFNIWorldChanger.org. And so you can make sure that he gets that. So we can start a petition to get CFNI a, a mascot. And so, uh, but anyways, man, I'm excited to bring the word to you guys. I was just, I, I love to do research. I love to watch documentaries. Those are my absolute most favorite things in the world to watch. And I was just doing my research about this guy that was seeing a psychologist about this problem that he had. And he was going to a psychologist, and, and he was seeing him, and he was like, hey, man, I've got this issue that I've had ever since I was a young boy. I've, I've had this issue, and now that I'm an adult, I still have it. Every night when I go to bed, I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. And the psychologist is looking at him, and, and you know how they do? They take notes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's taking notes about it. So tell me about this anxiety. He says, well, every time I go to bed, I begin to lay there. My thoughts consume me. And I'm just, I'm just tormented by this one thought. And the psychologist, well, what is it? I, I, I think that there's something under my bed that's going to get me. Right? And, and, and as I was reading this thing, I was convinced this was a Hispanic man. And I'll tell you why. Because in the Hispanic culture, there's this thing called el cucuy. Right? And so... El Cucuy will get you, like, like, I'm not even joking, man. They convince you that if you don't, if you don't eat your beans, El Cucuy is going to get you, right? He's like, so you're sitting there just, just gorging on beans because you're terrified of this mythical creature that might eat you, right? You know, you, you, you don't go to school, you don't pray, you don't do this, El Cucuy, right? So I'd imagine this was a Hispanic male terrified that he didn't do something in life. Because only, you know, they, they, they torment little kids and the uncles and the aunts and everybody gets in on it. And so this adult male is now struggling with this. And the guy tells him, he says, man, I think I can cure you. Pretty sure we can get you cured. He just got to come to me three times a week. And the guy said, all right, I can do that. He says, well, how much is each session? He says, it's 80 bucks. And the guy's like, man, I don't know. So I'm going to go home I'm going to sleep on that, right? So he goes home, and he's going to sleep on it. And he doesn't go back for, for weeks and weeks. And so finally, about a month and a half later, he's at the grocery store, and the psychologist is, is there with him, and uh, it runs into him there. And they begin to have a conversation. He's like, hey, man, how are you doing? He's like, I I'm doing really well. He's like, I'm actually doing really good. He says, really? He says, yeah, I've been cured of, of, of my whole little anxiety thing. And, and the, the psychologist, a little perplexed, looked at him and said, how in the world did you get cured? He said, I went home and I began to do the math on three times a week at 80 bucks a time. He said, I began to do the math. And, and he said, I, I was talking to my neighbor about it and said, hey, man, this is how much it's going to cost to do this. And his neighbor said, man, that's crazy. He said, man, I, I think so too. The neighbor said, man, I, I don't know about that. And he said, as I begin to talk to my neighbor a little bit more, he said, you know what, I think your money can be used somewhere else better. He said, so I went out and I bought myself a brand new truck. Check it out outside. It looks nice. It's nice. It's fancy. Got me a new truck. 
The psychologist looked at him and said, how in the world did the truck cure you? He said, what a truck at all that cured me is I was talking to my neighbor. My neighbor said, that's ridiculous what you believe in. It ain't nothing under your bed that's going to eat you. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come over to your house this evening. I'm going to bring my skill saw, and we're going to take the legs off that bed so there's no boogeyman gets the rest underneath that bed. Sometimes in our lives, we need a good friend of ours that will say, hey, bro, what you're struggling with, get over it. What is wrong with you, man? That anxiety that we have, you don't need to be hanging on to. Sometimes we need somebody in our lives that will speak a little bit of sense into us and say, hey, bro, that's ridiculous, man. I got you. I'm going to come over. I'm going to chalk the legs off of that bed, and we're going to remove that space where that anxiety might harbor. And so tonight, we're at the title of the message is Knowing He Cares. Knowing He Cares. There's a difference to know something. And then to put that thing into practice within you are knowing, right? There's, there's, there's a difference in I, I know something, and then there's a difference between I be knowing something, right? You know, like I be knowing. Sometimes you be knowing a lot of things. But we see this, there's a difference here. And, and our key scripture for this evening is coming out of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. And it reads like this, coming out of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. It reads like this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Read it one more time. Out of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I want to break this verse down for you just a little bit, not in the Greek, not in the Hebrew, but in the English, right? There is, there is power in words when you understand the definition of them. When you understand the weight that a word carries, it begins to open it up a little bit more and you begin to understand what is going on in context to what the author is writing. And as we begin to break this down, the first word that's in there is cast. The first word that's in there is cast. And the definition of that is an act of throwing something forcefully. An act of throwing something forcefully. There's an action that has to take place. In order to rid ourselves of the anxiety and the things that we begin to carry, there's something that has to take place, and you have to cast that off. There's 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 an action that takes place in that. The second word we begin to see is this right here is anxiety. It says cast all your anxiety, not the big things, not the little things, not the things in the middle, but every single bit of it. And he says cast all your anxiety on him. And anxiety is this right here. The fear or nervousness about what might happen. A lot of us get wrapped up in our heads about what might happen. Your roommate's mad at you because you burnt all the hot water at that hot water heater because you're having this conversation with so-and-so about what might happen. And when they say this, I'm going to say that. And then when they do this, I'm going to do that, right? And so you're doing, you're doing this mental judo in your head of a conversation that will probably never, ever happen. You get wrapped up all in your head about these scenarios of the what might, could, maybe, possibly be, happen. And we begin to get wrapped up all in this. And then it says this, that we are to cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for you. And that word cares is defined as this. To feel concern or interest or to attach importance to something. So what happens is, is we begin to come in here and we understand that there's an action that takes place if I'm going to cast my anxiety on him. There's an action that comes, that has to take place. There's a forceful thing that comes and says, I'm getting rid of this thing. I'm giving it to you. If you've ever thrown something at somebody, your roommates made you mad, your little brother, little sister, and you've thrown something on them, you've cast that on them. He says, cast all your anxiety, the things that you get wrapped up in, all of that stuff, the possibilities, the maybes, the my coulds, to give all of that to him. Why? Because he cares for you. When we begin to do that, when we begin to bring him our anxiety, when we begin to bring those things to him, he doesn't just say, okay, that's, that's good, but you have no idea what's going on in North Korea, bro. Look, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not really concerned that you're scared of your midterm. I'm really not, not, not that concerned that you're scared of that relationship you've got. I, I'm really not that concerned with that. He says, no, sir. What happens is according to the definition of care that he assigns special attention to that. He says, you know what? That matters to you. That matters to me. What concerns you concerns me. 
What happens is, is he's calling each and every one of us to pursue him, to accomplish what he's put inside of us. Each and every one of you have a purpose to accomplish something great for God. You say, well, I don't even know God. Well, let me tell you something. There's a reason why you're on this planet. If you're breathing this evening, you've got a pulse in your wrist, there's a reason for why you exist. There is a reason why you're breathing. And he's saying, hey, man, look, what happens is as we begin to amass all of these things, as we begin to gather all of this anxiety, the scenarios, the my could, the what maybes, we begin to get this thing all around us, it begins to slow us down for what God is calling us to do. He's saying, son, daughter, let's go. We've got, we got to be about the Lord's work. We've got to be about the Father's business. Let's get going. And we're saying, Lord, I'm doing my best, but you have no idea what I'm worried about. God, I'm doing my best, but you have no idea what I'm concerned about. Lord, I'm doing my best. And he's like, son, daughter, I never gave you that to carry. Cast all of that on me. And what happened is, is we'll look up and we'll see, God, where are you going? Lord, I'm doing my best to keep up with you, but I feel like I'm just carrying so, so much. And he's saying, man, all that anxiety that you got, that you wrapped up in, you don't need to be carrying that. I love to hunt and fish. Born and raised in Texas, man, I, I got that in my veins, right? When my boy was standing up here and he had the south in the mouth, I was like, that's my boy, right? And so, so as, and he said, zebra, right? And I was like, I understood him, right? So I was like, all right. But I love to hunt and fish. And so my, my dad loves to do it. We do it together. And, uh, and one evening, my, one day my dad said, hey, man, we're going we're gonna to clean the house. He said, but if we get done early, I'll take you fishing. I said, done. We're going to get this thing clean quick, right? And then he says, we're going to go to a special spot. If you know anything about a special spot when it comes to fishing, you just know it's going to be good, right? It's just like the special spot is just it's going to be good, right? It's a billion degrees outside in, in, in a Texas summer. But guess what? The special spot is going to be cool 72, right? Nice blue crowd cover, right? It's going to be great. And so he's like, all right, man, we'll we're, we're go fishing if we get the house clean. So me and my sister did our due. We got it cleaned up real quick. We sit down. We're ready to go. We loaded up all of our gear. And if you know one thing about my pops, man, is we are going to do it, and we're going to do it right Right? And so every bit of gear that we own is in a truck with us, right? Because this, man, I'm going to give you a tip. If you ask your wife, hey, baby, can I get this new thing? And she says yes. And every time you go to do whatever hobby that it is that you have and you never take said new thing, you'll never get another new thing in your life. Right? So every time you got to take it with you. The new thing's always got to go, right? And so, so we're loaded up in the truck and we're headed out to this special spot. And we're going over to Joe Pool Lake, right? And so that's where we're going. And, uh, and he says, hey, son, I'm going to take you to a brand new spot. Check it out. There's this long bridge we got across and we're going to go fish on the other side. Right? And it's already getting better, right? The other side, the special spot. And there's like more special, right? And so it's like, all right, here we go. We're going to load up. We're going. And so we, we get up there and we start crossing this bridge. And we're loaded up with every bit of gear that we have. And my dad's leading us. And we're so happy. I mean, this is it. Clean the house, right? You're getting the reward for your hard work. It's just like, this is great. And we start walking down this bridge. And I begin to notice something as I'm on this bridge. I, I, I begin to notice that there's a pattern happening here. There's a long steel beam running the length of this bridge. The bridge is about 200 yards long, running the length of this bridge. And about every three feet, there's a tie that goes across. I mean, you know, I was like, man, we're on railroad tracks. I was like, Dad, do they use this bridge for trains? And he said, no, right? And when your dad tells you something, you believe him, right? <laughs> when your dad tells you something, because a dad's job in life is to protect their kids. To raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, right? Come on, to, to see them not harmed, right? This is the moment, uh, years and years of therapy that I know. Is this where trust issues entered my life, right? And so if you begin to, begin to say, all right, Dad, is, is, this, is this bridge still in you? He said, no, son, they don't use this bridge any longer. And I said, all right, Dad, I believe you because you're Dad, right? And so we, we're walking, we're walking, walking. We're about a quarter of the way into the bridge. And all of a sudden, you know, we just feel a, a disturbance of the force. You just know something's different. You're just like, dude, there's something not right about right now, right? You know what I'm saying? He's like... What is going on? You just begin to hear this dull roar. I was like, no, nah, what is that, right? And all of a sudden, you just begin to hear, and I was like, what is that? And it's getting louder, it's getting louder, it's getting louder. And I was like, Dad, do you hear that? He said, walk faster. And I was like, so do you or do you not hear that? And I was like, can you confirm or deny that you hear what I hear, right? And he said, just walk faster. And so we start walking a little bit faster, right? And all of a sudden, man, around the bend, you see this thing. It's a train. 
it is rolling on us, right? And I was like, dear Lord. And it's got a little bit of land before it gets to the bridge. And so we're, we're walking on this thing. I'm about 10 years old. My sister's seven, and my dad's grown dad man, right? And so here we go. So, so he's like, all right. Then, then he looks at me, and he's like, all right, son, we got to go faster. I was like, dad, my little chubby legs do not go any faster than they're going right now, man. And so he's like, let's go. And so, so we're running, right? We're, we're, we're going. He's like, all right, we got to run now. By this time, we're about halfway onto the bridge. Now what's happening is the train is beginning to enter the bridge with us. As this happens, the bridge begins to shake violently, right? And so all of my little chubby fat is just shaking everywhere, man. And so, and so we're going. And he begins to tell me this, Jonathan, you can swim. You jump off the side if the train gets too close. And, I, and at this point, it hits me. It's real, right? Like my life's about to end. I look over, I look over the side, it's about a 35-foot drop to the water, Right? And so, and so it's like my life flashes before my eyes. My 10-year-old life and all that's there are Power Rangers and Ninja Turtles. And I was like, there's got to be more to life than just that. And so, so, so he starts telling me, he's like, Jonathan, you, you jump off. You dump all the stuff and you jump off the bridge. And I said, Daddy, okay. So we're running, right? And by this time you can't run, you can't run well because you can't breathe well. Because now you're doing that cry thing. <laughs> right? You're doing that thing, right? And, and so he tells me this. He said, Jonathan, if it gets bad. He says, I'm going to hold your sister over the edge, and I'm going to be between her and the train. And we're going we're gonna to pray that the train won't get me. If it does, she's going to fall to you. You have to get her and swim her to shore. And I'm like, look, you just downloaded me the plan of saving my family while I'm watching a train eat my dad, right? And I was like, this is, this is not good. And, then, and, then we're, and this is all while we're running. And he's like, I just want to let you know I love you. And I was like, this is the end, right? This is it. And so we're running. We're doing our best. We're moving. We're moving. We're moving. We're about three quarters of the way on, on, onto the bridge, and it, it, it's making a quick clip on us, and it doesn't look like we're going to make it. We're crying. We're screaming at this point. There's, there's just no way. I mean, we are loaded down. There's nowhere to go. I'm preparing in my mind, my 10-year-old brain, I'm going to jump off, and that's the end. And these, these men that were fishing on the other side of this bridge begin to hear us cry and hear us screaming. And they turned around. He had three boys with him. It was a dad and his three boys. And they came running to us, and they began to grab all that baggage that we were carrying. The moment they grabbed all of that baggage, everything in our situation changed. The moment that they were able to come to us and say, hey, what do you need? Take my stuff. I give it over to you. I don't want it. The moment that happened, I was able to pick up and go faster. My dad was able to carry my sister, and we made it to the other side. See, that's what happens is we begin to amass a lot of this baggage from all this anxiety. Sometimes what happens is that becomes a badge of honor that we begin to wear, and that becomes our identity of who we are. But we forget that we don't have to carry that junk. We don't understand that something is coming after us, that we have a call and a plan from God to accomplish on our lives. He's depending on us. You are on this earth for a reason. He loves you. He desires to be in relationship with you. As he looks at you carrying those things, it breaks his heart. And he's saying, son, daughter, if you would just cast all of that junk on me, none of this would be going on. We begin to sit there as a family, weeping and crying on the other side of that bridge. And he's like, he's just saying, I love you. I love you. And we're like, we, we love you too, Dad. I mean, we're just having this like, this like hallmark moment. He looks at me and he's like, all right, you guys ready to fish? And I was like, no, we don't want to fish. All we want is mom. That's it. You put my life in danger. I'm telling on you, right? And I was like, no, bro, you getting spanking, you getting grounded. Something bad is happening to you. He's like, well, you, so y'all don't want to fish? And I was like, no, no, we do not want to fish. No more. We do not want to do that. He's like, all right, well, so y'all want to go? I was like, yeah, we, we want to go home. He's like, well, you sure you want to go home? And I was like, yes, yes, we want to go home. He said, all right, well, let's pack up all our gear. So we started packing up all our gear. He said, all right. I was like, Dad, how are we going to get back to the truck? He said, we've got to walk back across the bridge. <laughs> I mean, come on, we gather these things in our lives, and we sometimes we forget that he cares for us. We forget the fact that, that there's a God who, di who, who desires to be in relationship with us. Sometimes I think it feels as almost if we, we, we try to impress him by how much we feel like we can handle. And we're like, God, look, look at all of this stuff that I have. Look at all of this stuff that I'm carrying. Look, it's so heavy. My back is getting crooked. I'm slipping discs. But God, I got it. I worship you. I go after you. And he said, son, daughter, I never designed you to ever carry that. And we forget that he actually cares about us. 
There's a deep desire in him to not see a struggle like that. But there's some action that takes place behind it. We actually have to begin to cast that stuff off. And I'm so thankful that it's not just the big things, it's not just the messy things, but it's everything. It's all the things. And then we forget sometimes that he actually does care. We get so wrapped up in our minds sometimes that we believe the situation is the situation. And that if we're in it, then God somehow put us there and that, that we're just supposed to marinate in it. And then he'll somehow just begin to come in and rescue us out of it. But what scripture tells us to do is you begin to cast those things off. To bring those things to him every time we're in his presence Every time that we're praying, man, Lord, look, man, I feel like I'm this. I feel like I'm that. Because what happens is, is we begin to create narratives in our mind, and that narrative eventually begins to become a reality. And so we begin to create this false prophecy in our mind that this, that, and the other is going to happen, and then we literally begin to live it out. In John chapter 9, there's this interesting interaction that Jesus has with a blind man. And Jesus is there, and they're in the region because of the Feast of Tabernacles. They're in Judea, and they're, in, they're in, the, in the region for the Feast of Tabernacles. And him and the disciples are walking around, so there's 13 people there. I love context in Scripture and what's going on. 13 people having a conversation. And the disciples and Jesus see this blind man who's just hanging out, who's sitting there. He's doing what, what, what a blind man would do. He's a beggar. He's just doing the do. He's just the every day of life. He's doing the do. Sitting there with a can, sitting there with whatever it may be, and he's just being blind, and he's begging for money. And I would imagine as a blind man, festival time would be a high, high output time. You have a sign with a Zelle on it, cash app, have all of them, right? He's like, look, bro, we can do Apple Pay, whatever you got, we, we can roll. And I would imagine that this is going to be a time where he's going to get a lot of money. There's a lot of people around. And the disciples begin to talk about this man. And in order for them to be talking about him, they had to have been close enough to see him. And in order for them to be close enough to see him, they had to have been close enough for this blind man to hear him. And remember, he is blind and not deaf. They begin to talk about this blind man. They begin to turn this man into a point of discussion. They begin to talk to him. They talk about him. And they say, Jesus, who sinned here? Look at this blind dude. Look at him. Who sinned? Him or his parents? And Jesus begins to talk to him. He says, neither. What are you talking about? I mean, neither of them did this. This is what he says It's happening here. He says this. He says, so that the works of the Lord may be displayed in him. He said, why is this man like this? So that the works of the Lord may be displayed in him. See, sometimes our trials and our tribulations, they come to produce maturity in us. Come on, so that we'll be lacking Nothing according to James chapter 1. But sometimes, maybe, just maybe, the things that you're facing in life, some of the biggest problems that you have is so that Jesus can show up and show out in a big way. And when you see that happen, when you see that thing, when God brings you out of that, it's so that you can begin to tell people how good of a God we serve. How this God's not far removed from our situations or what we're going through but that he's actively involved with us and he desires relationship with us and that he actually cares for us. We see this interaction with this blind man happen. We're going to be in John chapter 9, starting in verse 6. And after he had done that and he said that to the disciples, he spit on the ground and he made mud from the saliva. And he applied the mud to to his eyes and they said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is, uh, if you're from the south, Siloam, right? And so, which is translated sin. So he left and he washed and he came back seeing. This interaction that happens right here, Jesus doesn't talk to the man. The man doesn't engage with Jesus. There's not this interaction where he says, hey, the, the, the blind man's coming up to him and saying, I've heard you are Jesus. I heard you can heal. Will you do a miracle in me? As the disciples are making this man a point of discussion, Jesus turns this man into a point of compassion. And he has compassion on this man. And what Jesus does here is a very, very personal miracle. As he sits down and he kneels before this man and begins to spit on the ground. As the blind man, right, maybe not knowing Jesus has approached, all of a sudden you just feel hot breath. Sir, 
you were too close, right? You feel the tickle of Jesus' beard on your chin. <laughs> Stop it, right? You know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, you just hear, what are you doing, sir? Sir, what are you doing? Sir, sir, what are you doing? And then all of a sudden, just on your face. And then you hear one word from Jesus. Go. Okay. He's <laughs> just like, all right, dude, you know. But I would imagine what happened in this moment is that Jesus saw this man. I'd imagine every day of this guy's life, he prayed to the God of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he prayed, God, restore my sight. Is this really the way it's got to be? Is this, is, this, is this my lot in life? See, what happens is suffering, when you have suffering like that, It conditions you to believe that the situation will never, ever get better. And you just begin to live in that space. This is the way it's going to be. Scholars believe this man to be about 30 years old. He had no idea that this was the day that his prayers would be answered. That Jesus would show up and turn him from a point of discussion to a point of compassion. Kneel down before this man and actually care about him. I imagine similar to what happened when Jesus was writing in the sand. The Bible doesn't record what he wrote, but I would imagine what he wrote was extremely personal. As Jesus has a moment with this man, I would imagine whatever he's whispering in his ear is impactful. And he tells him, go. Wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he leaves that place, he can see. As the man is now leading himself by a stick to the pool, he's now able to see on the way back. In verse 8, it reads like this. So the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying this. Is this not the one who used to sit and beg? And others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. The guy that couldn't see had his eyes closed. This man has his eyes open. There's a difference. Closed and open, right? And then the other guy had a stick. This guy has no more stick, right? Different guy. He says, the man himself kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, well, how then were your eyes open? He answered, the man who was called Jesus made mud and he spread it on my eyes. And he said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. Right? (laughs) Why did he say that? Because he was blind when Jesus left. Right? Right? He, he was not seeing. You, you, you understand this, sir. This morning, I had to fumble around for my toothbrush, right? And I no longer need to fumble around. I can see. What happens is, is the Pharisees begin to grab this man up because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And they gather him up and they begin to interrogate him. So tell us what happened. The sinner, the sinner did what? He's like, bro, look, it was, it, was, it was pretty strange. I was sitting there. These guys were talking about me like most people do. They came to me. All of a sudden, this man's breath in my face, the tickle of his beard, the spit in the mud. And all of a sudden, I went to the pool and I could see. And then, no, 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 I tell it again. He tells it again and again and again. This would have been the most interesting episode of Judge Judy. This would have been like the best, right? Then they bring in his parents. And they're like, go find this man's parents. And they come in like, oh, my gosh, son, hey, how are you doing? You can see. Oh, my gosh, check it out. Oh, how many fingers? Three. Okay, that's awesome, right? It's like. He couldn't do that before Pharisees. He couldn't do that. Nope, he couldn't do that. Three, yes. Right? And so they're, they're sitting there and they bring him in. They say, can you confirm this man was blind? Yes, I can. Well, how long have you known this man? His entire life. And, uh, and mom, dad, um, would, you, would you say he was blind from birth? Absolutely. Came out of the womb, couldn't see. Right? And how would you confirm his state? Now, he can see. Right? It's incredible. It's awesome. And they looked at him and said, well, can you testify who healed him? He said, whoa. No, 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 no. We can't do that. We're not going to do that. We let him talk. He's of age. He can explain what happened to himself. Because what would happen is they would be taken out of the synagogue. They would be out of relationship and communion and, 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 and out of all of society from these people. They would be removed from that. And he said, you know what? That's not going to happen. We're not going to do that. He can speak for himself. He's grown. So the Pharisees bring him in a second time. And they begin to interrogate him again. And this is the conversation that happens with this man. We're going to be in John chapter 9 in verse 24. We're going to skip down into the chapter. It says, the second time they summoned the man who had been blind. He says, give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. We know this man is a sinner. And he replies with this, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. 
One thing I do know is I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. I woke up this morning, my eyes didn't work. Now they work. I see you. There's colors. They're beautiful. They're amazing. They're awesome. Look, bro, I don't know what happened. Whether there's a sinner or not, bro, that does not concern me. All I know is I had an interaction with this man who calls himself Jesus, and the moment I had that interaction, everything in my life changed. Everything about me was different, bro. My eyes are open. I now see. There's things about me that I never knew about myself that I'm seeing now for the very first time. See, sometimes when God does something in your life, it's not just for you, but it's for you to tell everybody else, Let me tell you what God has done for me, bro. I may not have all the details figured out. I might have all the theology lined out. But let me tell you something. I had an encounter with Jesus. I was one way. And then after the encounter, I was a completely different way. I don't know how it happens. I don't know. You believe it. You don't believe it. But let me tell you about me. Because I was changed. Whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. But what I do know is that I once was blind, but now I see. I think a lot of times we get compelled to, by pressure to have everything figured out. God, if you, if, you really, if you really care about me, then you'll download to me all of these things that, that are going to happen. Sometimes he's saying, son, daughter, I'm healing you. I'm doing these things. Why? Because you're mine. This man had no relationship with Jesus. There was no reason why Jesus should have cared for this guy. But the reason why he did was because he was his and I don't know how much longer after this Jesus would take up a cross and he'd be, he would be crucified for this man's sins. He'd be broken for his healing. He did it because he's his. And he loved him. There was a man I was interacting with a, a, a couple of weeks ago. He began to tell me, hey, bro, so uh, you're a pastor. And I said, yes. He says, do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I said, absolutely I do. He says, I don't. I said, I'm sorry. He said, so I, I don't believe it's real. And I was like, man. I'm so sorry that you don't believe it's real, but, uh, but I do because I've experienced it. He said, I bet you're at some big service and, and all these things and the lights and the pastor, the preacher and all this stuff. I said, no, just the opposite. I was, a, I was a Baptist kid that wanted more of Jesus, went to my friend's house. He laid hands on me to receive the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, nothing happened. He looked at me like, What? And I said, nothing happened. I looked at my friend. I was like, dude, you got sin in your camp. There's something wrong with you. You cannot give me your Holy Spirit. There's something broken with you. And he's like, no, man. I said, but do you have a worship CD I can have? He said, yes. So we went to Napster. We legally pirated a worship CD. And, uh, and, and so the, minister, the Lord ministered to me through, uh, through Napster, right? And so I would take that CD for, with me from my truck to my room, back and forth, back and forth. It was with me everywhere I went. I mean, this is old school Rick Pino and Jason Upton and all like, like this heavy, heavy type worship stuff. And so I'm listening to this stuff. This Baptist kid who's doing his best to go after God. He's got a past that, that, man, it's crazy. But I'm doing my best to go after God. And I'm in this spot when I'm cleaning my room. And, uh, and I just begin to be in this, in this moment. And I just begin to tell God, I love you so much. Like you have no idea how much I love you. Thank, thank you for, for changing me from who I used to be to who I am now. Lord, if you never do another thing for me in my whole life, you being on the cross is enough for me. And as I begin to tell him, I love you, I felt like I had cheapened that word throughout my life. I would shot a bunch of holes in it, and as I was giving it to him, it was something that was kind of ugly. I was like, Lord, look, this is the best I've got. When I say I love you, I, I hope you know it means more than what it looks like. And as I begin to present that to him, you know, by myself, in my room, weeping on the floor, this thing came over me. I didn't even really even know what it was. And all of a sudden, man, I just began to feel this overwhelming sense of love. Over, I never, never experienced anything like it before. And all of a sudden, as I was crying out in English, those English words ran out. And I began to pray out in this beautiful prayer language. And I'm telling him every bit of this. He says, oh, really? And I said, bro, in my room by myself. See, you will never, ever, ever be at the disadvantage with someone with an argument when you lived out an experience. Never. So a lot of times the Lord comes in here and he says, son, daughter, I love you so much. I care about you more than you know. And what I'm doing in you isn't just for you. But man, you need to tell people what's going on. 
But a lot of times we get stuck in that spot where we want to hang on to our anxiety. We want to keep those things. Why? There's comfort in it. There's identity in it. Come on, that's the thing that gives us attention. And so we don't want to let those things go. But the moment we begin to do that, and the Lord begins to show his compassion on us because he cares for you. He's not intimidated by your questions. He's not intimidated by your unbelief. He's not intimidated by the things that you think that intimidate him. When your belief in him does not change the fact that he is God. And so as you begin to present those things to him, he begins to show up and show out in big ways. There's three things I want you guys writing down on how we can begin to cast our cares on him. The first thing is this right here. Is you got to settle into his care. You got to settle into his care. A lot of times we want to do and we don't want to be. We show up to the doctor and say, doctor, let me show you how to fix me. And the doctor said, hey, bro, we're here because you try to fix yourself. Right? It's like we, a lot of times we try to fix ourselves. And the Lord said, hey, man, look, just settle into my care. Just go ahead and settle into this thing. This is what it says right here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, just come to me and just rest, Bubba. Just settle in. But a lot of times we want to come in and tell him how to begin to fix us. Lord, this is what I read on WebMD. This is what's wrong with me. I'm going to save you. I'm going to diagnose myself. Lord, this is how we need to fix me. And he's saying, son, daughter, just sit. Just rest. Just be. Let me begin to work. Second thing that we begin to do, we settle into, after we settle into his care, being to cast our cares onto him, is you got to be in discussion with the Father. You got to be in discussion with the Father. As you're in discussion with the Father, as you're talking to him, he's whispering into your son, daughter, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. The moment when the anxiety begins to rage and all those things, and you start looking at a situation that seems familiar, he begins to come in and say, son, daughter, I got you. Don't you worry about that. I've got you. Just hang on. A couple of, last week, actually, just last week, last Thursday, my kids had, uh, for over a year, had been wanting to go to this place called the Dude Perfect Tour. If you've ever, if you've ever seen YouTube before, there's these guys called Dude Perfect, and they do like they do things with their feet and their their hands and like all sorts of crazy stuff. And my kids love it, and so they bought tickets to go see them last year. But there was this thing that happened. You may not have heard about it. It was called COVID, and so no was doing anything, and so so we had to wait a year to go see it. Went and saw it. It was awesome. It was great. They, they gave an altar call at the end. And so we left all hyped. And as, we, as we're leaving the place, we go to get in the elevator, and we're in the elevator. And it's just a great time. You know, it's just one of those moments you're like, yes, this is the best. As we're sitting there, we get in the elevator. My son likes to do this thing when we get in the elevator. He calls it a dance party. And we just be an act silly and crazy. And so we start dancing in the elevator and all this stuff. And, and I've been in plenty of elevators, and uh, my son hasn't. And, uh, and so, so as we get in the elevator, we start dancing. The elevator makes a sound I've never heard before. Boom, boom. And you're just like, what? That's not right. And then it makes a second sound. It just lets you know it's like really broken. Right? It's just like, that's not right. As we're sitting in there, the elevator stops. No lights on the panel. Nothing's happening. And it's, it's just, it's wild. It's crazy. It's not working. Elevator is stuck. That would begin a 40-minute ordeal of us sitting in the elevator. My daughter immediately goes in anxiety mode. Oh, my God, we're going to die. And I was like, we are. We are going to die. Close your eyes and bow your heads. If you want to receive Jesus. And I was like, man. So, so I was like, we, you, yes, we're going to die. She's like, Dad, you said nothing. But you would never let anything happen to us. And I was like, you're right. And I had immediate flashbacks to myself, 10-year-old, at that bridge. And I was like, that's me. I'm a loser, Dad. And so we, we get into this thing. And I was like, hey, look, I got you. We, we got this thing. As we're sitting there, man, they would begin to, they would begin to, to just the anxiety begin to well up in them. I said, hey, look, look, I got you. Look at me. I've called for help. It's on the way. The voice from dad would begin to calm them. And then what I begin to do is I begin to remind them of what we've done. And the other things that we've gotten into, how the Lord had got us out of those things. I said, let me tell you something. God's good. He's got us. Remember what we just did. It was awesome. It was amazing. A lot of times we get wrapped up in these things and we say, Lord, this is the way it's going to be. Lord, I've seen all of this before. It's repeating. He's saying, son, daughter, I've got you. The third thing is this right here. If we're going to cast our cares, is you got to transfer ownership out of those things. You got to say, look, Lord, I don't want it anymore. I'm done. You literally got to begin to transfer ownership of them. I sold a house recently last year, and I'd never done that before. It was the first time I ever sold a house. 
And so it was, it was kind of weird and it was kind of strange not having a place to go to. I was like, okay, great. And I'd put, put it in autopilot on the way home from work. And I'd find myself pulling into the subdivision. I was like, man, I don't live here anymore. And I thought to myself, I live in Texas. If I were to go to that door and try to open it up, those people would have full right to shoot me on the spot. I was like, that's dangerous. Better not do that anymore. But I began to think, man, I no, no longer have ownership of that place. I don't have it anymore. I've transferred ownership of that. It no longer belongs to me. I have no right there. I have no right of being there. It doesn't belong to me. I think sometimes when we hand our, our anxiety, our cares, and all these things over to God, we literally begin to lease them out. Like, God, look, I'm, I'm going to give you this. You can be a tenant here. You can clean this up. But I still own it. And he's saying, son, daughter, you got to transfer ownership away from that. you got to give that completely and fully to me. you got to begin to trust me that I got that, that I'm taking care of that thing. We can't hold on to it any longer. Guys, I'm here tonight just to tell you one simple thing. doesn't matter where you've been. doesn't matter what you've gone through. doesn't matter who you are or your family lineage. He loves you and he cares about you. There's a God in heaven who desires a relationship with you. And he's here tonight. And if you're not in relationship with him, he desires to be in relationship with you. If you would just close your eyes for me just a moment. Just bow your heads. We're wrapping up and I promise we won't be labor this, but this is why we're here tonight. Now you got exams and you're tired and all these different things, probably hungry. And that's okay, I'm all those things too. But I don't want to leave this spot without ministering to you tonight. If you're in here and you say, how in the world would, would a God that, that lives in heaven actually care about me? Why would he care about me? And the answer to that is simple. It's because you're his and he loves you. you. say, but how does he love me? He doesn't even know me. He knows everything about you. He actually, the scripture says, knit you in your mother's womb. He knows how many hairs you have on your head or used to have on your head. And he desires a relationship with you. Without belaboring this point, but I don't want to leave this spot without asking you this simple question. Do you want to be in relationship with Jesus tonight? Do you want to have access to him to be able to cast your cares, all of your anxiety, everything that you've got onto him? And say, Daddy, look, you got it. You handle that. That's yours. I'm going to ask you to do something courageous with me. I'm not going to make you do anything strange or weird. I just want to know who I'm praying with in here tonight. You see, that's me, Pastor Don. Then please pray for me. I just want you to slip your hand up right where you're at. You say, that's me, Pastor Don. Please, I want to join in right relationship with Jesus. I see your hand. Anybody else? I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. You put your hands down with me. I want to say a quick prayer with you. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. There's nothing special or fancy about how you say it or what you do. But what matters is if you mean it in your heart. I'm going to have everybody in the, in the IB say it with me like this so you don't feel alone. Let's say it together. Say, Jesus. Oh, you knew better than that. Say, Jesus, tonight I give you my heart, all my successes, all my failures. Lord, I give it to you. I pray right now that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, and I promise to do my best to live for you. Write my name in your book of life. In Jesus' name. Keep your head back for just a moment. I want to minister to you to a second point. If you're in here tonight and you've got these things that you've been hanging on to, the what ifs, the might could be's, the, the maybe hums, and you've got these things that you just, that you're just holding on to, the Lord's calling you tonight to begin to transfer ownership of those things. He's calling you to say, that is no longer mine. Maybe you've leased them out to him. You say, man, I desire a little bit of, of ownership, but I'm getting rid of those things. And tonight's the night where you begin to transfer ownership and say, Lord, no longer do I own that, but you do. No longer do I have access to that. Lord, I only give it to you. If you would, where you at, just stand tonight. Just stand where you at. Just go ahead and stand. And I just want you to just begin to lift your hands this evening. Just begin to say, Lord, I transfer it over to you. Lord, I give you, I give it to you. Whatever it may be, whatever it is that you're hanging on to. Come on, man, with the fact that, that am I going to accomplish the things that God's called me to do? 
Come on, am I ever going to get out of, out of sea if not? Lord, how, how does it even go? Will there even be a church for me to go to? Come on, you, you've put in my heart nations. Lord, how does that even transpire? How in the world do I even begin to, to start that thing? The Lord say, hey, man, just begin to give that to me. That's not your problem to deal with. I've simply called you, and you've said yes, and here we go. Jesus, tonight, Father God, Lord, we relinquish our ownership over these, these things that we have, Father God, the, 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 the anxiety points that seem to keep us up late at night, the things that swirl around in our heads, Father God, the, the things that plague us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we relinquish ownership over to you, Father God. Lord, we no longer desire to hold those things or to have those things, but Lord Jesus, we forfeit all rights over to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we cast it on you, Father God. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are doing something in us, Lord Jesus, that you care about us deeply, Father God. We settle into your care, Lord Jesus. Father God, may we begin to listen and tune into your voice and know who you are, Father. Lord Jesus, and here and now, Lord, we transfer ownership, Lord Jesus, of these things over to you, Father. Lord, I bless these people, Father God, your servants, Lord Jesus, your children, Lord. We bless them in your holy and your precious name. Amen.